Welcome to Unselfishly Me, a podcast all about self-love, self-care and everything in between. I'm Jane, a personal trainer with a focus on self-love. Each week we'll be chatting to someone about their self-love journey, how long it took and what it took to get there. So today we have a slightly different topic to talk about. We are talking about the grief of losing a parent. So I've gathered some of my friends who have very, very recently gone through it as about five weeks ago. And then others that have gone through it, I think, 14 or 15 years ago. Um, So there's different aspects in different times and they're all at different stages of their grieving Um, So it's just a nice way for you to hear, perhaps some of you are going through it right now or you've gone through it a few months ago um, and I just hope that maybe one of their stories resonates with you and you can feel like you're not alone and maybe some healing can take place for yourselves as well. So each one has a different story, each one is dealing with it differently and each one will resonate with those of you that have gone through it or are going through it or maybe in the future it's something that you can come back to on this episode or a friend recommends it and just something that you can keep and listen back to and maybe just use the tools that they are recommending that they've done that maybe it can help you guys as well. So today we are talking about something different. We're talking about the grief of losing a parent. So I'll be joined by a few of my friends. Today we are starting off with Delia. You all know her as my bestie. So she recently lost her dad. So we are going to be talking about the most recent will be hers. Um, so just excuse us if we get a bit emotional because it is quite <laughs> recent. Delia, how, when, how long has it been now? Well, he died on the 29th of January. So it's it's very recent. Is it two months? Oh, it's a uh, uh, of February. Uh, it's one, a month and one, a bit. And one and a half months. Yeah. Mm. So tell us about your dad. Oh, I was so crying already. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hold your hand. Uh, yeah, we need lots of tissues. A yoga towel. Yeah. Um, my dad was, well, I went to see a spiritualist after he passed away. And she, as she described it, he was my anchor. And she's a parent is often an anchor in your life. So by that, obviously, the visual is it's it's a constant. It's something mm. that grounds you. And no matter how chaotic your life is, you can always go back to that. So when you lose that, mm. it's a big loss. And he was that to me. He was very intelligent. He was very kind. He was always someone I could always go to for mm. if, whatever problem I had. He would always accept me. And I always knew he was that stability in my life. So mm. yeah, that's what I've lost so it's so recent um how have you coped since then well for me it was a little bit tricky because um controversially i suppose for some my dad was an atheist he did raise me as a christian and he was he was very heavily christian as a child he was went to a catholic school but in his older years he decided to become an atheist so he didn't believe in a god and an afterlife and i think that when someone dies it can get quite tricky because a lot of death and a lot of uh, the support that is around death is around a religion. And when you have a funeral, it's a very religious thing to, to talk about. The fact that you're going to see them again is a huge comfort. And the fact that God is, is with them mm. is a comfort. So when you're not necessarily a part of that belief system, it can get quite tricky because death is very final. And I think that's a horrible thing for a human to deal with is the fact that this is never coming back. Mm. So I think there's a lot of comfort in religion, which I didn't necessarily have to fall back on. But I think human beings get a little bit desperate at a time like this. And I actually went to, I consulted with a spiritualist who kind of more is about the universe and energies and that type of thing. And it's it's kind of a non-religious person to go to. And she, I'm, I'm skeptical, I will be honest. Mm. I walked in there thinking, I know a lot of other people have gone to speak to this lady, so let me go. What is the harm? I need some kind of support. I'm desperate. I'm sad. Let's go and talk to her. And when I went to go and speak to her, she immediately mentioned my sister's name, Mm. which was quite strange. Despite the fact that she does not know me, she is not on my social media. There's Mm. no way she could have known. She's an older woman. She's not like into social media stalking. Mm. She has no way of knowing my sister's name. And she said she's you know, connected to the right soul. And she started speaking about him and, and what he wanted to tell me and the fact that he loves me. And I must admit, it was actually quite a comfort. Mm. And she spoke about my own energy and it really did 
strange enough, just helped to talk to somebody and bawl my eyes out and cry for 45 minutes. Mm. And she also told me, you know, you're going to see him again, which I don't, I don't necessarily know, but it's mm. really nice to have someone to say that yes. to you. And she said that every day that goes past, you're a day closer to seeing him again. And I think mm. just the thought of that, even if, if even, even if you happen. don't, even if it doesn't happen, yeah. it's actually a comforting thought for a human being. It's like a new countdown. Yeah. Mm. And his hope. Mm. He's not gone forever. Mm. And she said that the way that you can connect with him, she says, you know that feeling when you feel like you want to speak to him? Mm. She said, speak to him, he can hear you. Mm. And even if that's not true. <laughs> it's whatever makes you feel better. Exactly. It's whatever makes you feel better. And I think that's what a lot of religion yes. is with death. Yeah. So a spiritualist kind of person really helped with that with me. Yeah. And a funny story. Um, I've got, I'm just looking at my phone here. So on the 30th of January, mm. I was at a book launch, uh, an exclusive books in Gateway. And I had like the night before we'd been chatting and I was like, I just wish you would send me a sign so that I can send it to Delia and make sure that she's okay and just share this with her. And because she had told me that the night before she had been driving home from the hospital and it was like midnight and Robbie Williams um, angels Angel. came on. Mm. So I was like, maybe if I open Instagram, the song will be on there or something and I can mm. send it to her because that would be her sign. And no, that didn't happen. But then I was at this event waiting for it to start and I just randomly went across to um I was walking and voice noting and I walked across to um this one shelf so I only had one hand free because I was busy multitasking and <laughs> voice noting with the other hand and I just randomly looked up and I was like oh it's um at the spiritual you know the spiritual book section and I used my left hand I grabbed this book and I opened it um, to a random page with one hand, which I think is quite a feat in itself. So the book is co is written by Tom Butler Bowden, and it is 50 spiritual classics. So the greatest books distilled. So they break down like each page is um, a different book. So it says your shortcut to the most important ideas on self-discovery, enlightenment and purpose. Like I'd never heard of this book ever. And then the, the page that I had turned to with my one hand was says 1994 Journey of Souls. So that's the book. And it says, people associate death as losing our life force when actually the opposite is true. We forfeit our body in death, but our eternal life energy unites with the force of a divine oversoul. Death is not darkness, but light. And then it said, I am not a religious person, but I found the place where we go after death to be one of order and direction. And I have come to appreciate that there is a grand design to life and after life. So in, at the bottom it says, in a nutshell... Physical death is merely an event in the movement of a soul from one domain to another. So, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's I was like, after he died. yeah, the next day that was. And he always knew, as be, knew you as being my best friend. Yeah. So, so that is. So that was his sign, basically. It was. Yeah, it was. It was and definitely. what Sharon, the spiritualist, said to me. She said, he will be sending you these signs and look out for them. Yeah. And the fact that you sent me that. It was insane. I literally, yeah. And even the mention of, of the fact that I'm not a religious person. Yes, and he wasn't. He wasn't. It was just, so wow. So the afterlife is a very gray area yeah. if you're not religious. But I think grief, everyone deals with it differently. And whatever you believe is what you believe. And other mm. people must respect that and just let you get on with how you want to deal with things. Mm. Like, I, it bothers me when people are like... But you're not even crying. Like, how how can you not be affected? But everyone is so everyone different. Be different. You know, and you don't know that someone is, they look happy during the day because they have to get on with their life. But at That's night, it. they're crying in the bath. Absolutely. You know? Well, a friend of mine dealt with the death of her, her daughter. And mm. that is the absolute worst thing mm. on earth. And she looks so strong because she has two other children. She has yeah, to look has after. To be. Yeah. She has to be. And I've got newfound respect for her because I didn't, this is the first person who's ever died in my life. Mm. I've never dealt with a death. And it's been such a huge one because it's a parent. Massive loss. Yeah. Like my only parent. Mm. And I loved him so much. Mm. So for this, I mean, at the age of 38, you sort of think, well, I've I've experienced most things now. Mm. You know, even though obviously I haven't. I think we, that's probably someone who's who's 58 will laugh at me. But you do get to a point in your life where you think I'm growing up now. I kind mm. of, I've seen a lot. Mm. And then somebody, you experience a big loss like this. You, and you realize you, there's a lot that you don't know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the the fact that she's experienced a death like that mm. of a child, I have so much respect for her to just carry mm. on with her life and and look after her other children that are still here. And sure, you have so much respect for people that have handled such a huge loss. Yeah, and they keep going. 
Mm. And some people don't keep going and some people completely fall apart. And like you say, you've got to kind of respect everyone's different levels of what they can handle. Yeah. And how they handle it. Mm. But it is certainly, it's it's not an easy one. It's one of the worst things that we've had to face ever. Yeah. And I mean, it's still so fresh as well. And, and yet sometimes it feels like it didn't happen. Yes. So you feel like it's surreal. And do you sometimes still reach for the phone to like tell him something? Oh, yes, or? he's still my favorite. My first favorite contact is yeah. dad. Yeah. With a picture of him and me. Oh. And you look at it and you're like, oh, he's not here anymore. Yeah, like I can't actually. No, or something happened. You can never this... speak to him again. Yeah, I think that's the that for me would be the worst thing, mm. no matter who it is. Is that? Well, you've lost your grand. Yeah, like you can't. It's gone. It's yeah, you mm. can't contact them. No. It's not even the visit. It's like just mm. to pick up the phone. Or... Never. It's a it's a very weird thing for a human being to comprehend. Yeah, especially because what we crave is connection. Mm. So it's like literally the opposite. It's gone. Yeah. Mm. And having two kids, like, how did you explain it to them? Like, Chad is still quite young. Mm. Explaining things to your children is possibly worse than having to go through it yourself. Yeah. So my, my eldest, I just said to him, you know, Grandpa went to hospital. And he said, yes, I know. And I said, Grandpa didn't come out. Grandpa did die. And mm. I actually learned from the, the doctors who looked after my dad when he was dying. It sounds callous, but it's very important to use the right words. Because yes. when somebody dies, it's so surreal. Yeah. That if you say things like pass away or yes, it's actually too vague. And they kept on saying to me, you know, your dad is terminal. Because I kind of sat by his bed and he was, he, I, I was listening to him barely breathing and mm. uh, his heart kept stopping. And I still thought, you know, maybe he's going to come around. Yeah. <laughs> well, hope. There's nothing yeah, wrong with you, having hope. Yeah. You kind of think, oh, well, no, no, it's, it's not, not, this is not really happening. Yeah. So they have to say to you, and even when he actually did pass away and the doctor said to me, well, your father has died. Yeah, and it's they such a to, it's a jolting say, word. They have to say it. Yeah, and they say it on purpose. So I said the same thing to Bradley. I didn't say, you know, Grandpa. We lost away, him because he'll be because kids will be like, "Where's where he did gone? he go?" Yeah. So I just said, you know, Grandpa didn't come out of hospital. Grandpa has died. Yeah, and he cried, and I said that, um, you know, you can ask me any questions you would like to ask me. Yeah, he didn't really ask too much. He's he's mm. very young, so I mm. should imagine in a few years they'll probably you it'll know, come out maybe yeah. a little bit later. But I was very final about it. Mm. So he does know Grandpa is no longer here. Mm. Grandpa has died. And has Chad since asked anything? He hasn't actually. Okay. But he's so little. He's so at little. The age of, at the age of Subconsciously five. Subconsciously probably knows something. But probably knows something, but yeah. sure, at the age of five, they are still, Mm-mm. they don't, they're not as conscious of things. And as. I mean, you used to visit him a lot. Yes. Whereas the children weren't seeing him as they're much as, as you did. Yes. No, exactly. They weren't yeah. as connected with him. It's not like he was picking them up from school every day or no, part yes. of their daily life. Yes. Because he was quite ill. I so. think he, if it, that was the case, then they would have been asking because it would have been um, a such daily, a routine. Mm, a routine loss. Yeah. Which kids are more common. They, they associate that with yeah something. But yeah, he was a visit type of thing. He wasn't part of yes. the everyday life. So it, it didn't impact them that much. Yeah. For which now I'm kind of grateful. Yes. I feel such a loss. And I'm glad yes. they don't have to feel yes. as great a loss. But it does put a spotlight on yourself and your own mortality. Mm. Definitely started worrying about myself a lot more. So what have you learned from this whole situation, do you think? I've learned that you need to look after your health mm. hugely. Um, your children need you, even as adults. Mm. You know, you haven't your job's not done when your kid is 18. Mm-mm. Like a lot of parents think. Yeah, they're like, oh, I just have to get them to 18. I just have to get them 18 and then they can, you know, they can move out. Then I can, mm. then it doesn't matter if my husband and I get divorced. Then it doesn't matter if, if I never see them again. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It actually does. Yeah. Your kids actually, they, your kids need you for your whole life. So this is also ties into unselfishly me and self-love and self-care as well, is that mm. you need to look after yourself first. You really do. Yeah. My dad didn't look after himself. Yeah. He wasn't a healthy man. Mm. He could have lived longer had he lived a, a better, more healthier life. Mm. He didn't look after himself mm. and your children need you to do that. So basically we are telling you to, from today, start being a little yourself. bit healthier. And again, it's not about what you look like. No. Just walking along the promenade or in a park or just, you know, walking to be healthy. And it's, go have your blood pressure checked and yeah. cholesterol checked and that boring yes. stuff. Just focus on the inside. It's not about the outside. It's not all about the outside. Yeah. I'm a bodybuilder and I love aesthetics yes. and I love all of that. But now you know. But at the end of the day, I'm worried about health. my internal. Yeah. And I'm very, I mean, my children are actually so proud of me. Mommy is so strong. Mm. They love. So nice. It's lovely. Yeah. My kids are so proud of me for being that. And yeah. then later on, they're going to realize that I'm going to be an active part of their life. God willing. I'm going, yeah. well, me saying God willing is quite ironic. But anyway, 
<laughs> universe willing. <laughs> universe willing. I want to be able to pick up their grandchildren from school and help yes. them with their grandkids and be a huge active yes. part of everybody's life for as long as I can. Yeah. So my sport, yes, it is aesthetic, and I do love that side of things, but it's there's a lot yeah. more to it. Um, so for someone who's maybe going through it as of today or yesterday or last week, like what advice would you give them or coping mechanisms or anything? Just expect the unexpected. Hey? I mean, mm. sometimes you think you're fine. Mm. And then when I had to pick up my dad's ashes, for example, mm. I was fine that day. And then I went to go and pick up my dad's ashes on my own. And I walked into the funeral parlor and I see this little cylinder <sighs> and it's got his name on it. So weird. And I absolutely broke down because I could see his name and I thought, that's all that's left of him. Yeah. So you just get blindsided. Yeah. Um, I can get an email regarding some administrative thing with his name on it. Yeah. And I'll be fine that day. And then I'll get that email and I'll be like, oh, but dad's actually not here. Yeah. That is going to throw you. And just be kind to yourself with ups and downs, like you say, yes, daily. Yes, just expect it. Even the other day you said something about I had like a really bad day. And I was like, I had just a bad day. Mm. Let yourself feel... A Stop, don't try and hide it and don't try no. and hide it from other people. Like with the kids, it's good for them to see you sad and explain it emotions is. to them. Yes, it is and, very good. And to normalize being sad. I think that's mm. also with, with depression and everything and anxiety. People in the last few years have tried to hide it, but it's don't. not healthy for the kids. They need to see it's okay to have sad days because what if that they, is them? They, they, they need to see day. it's normal. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I do. In the beginning, I was trying to hide it. Mm. then. I thought, no, no, I actually don't. Mm. Actually Especially with boys. I think it's mm. good to and to for them to know it's okay for them to be sad, sad and they don't something. always have to be tough and all. No, but don't boys to don't cry. Uh, actually, oh, yeah. they should. No, that the whole, I'm really raising my sons to not. It's important. Not be part of that patriarchy and that mm. nonsense. They already know not to say things like, you throw like a girl. And, oh, good. Mm. Oh, they know. Pepe will teach them, eh? She will oh, no, retaliate. They're amazing. They're amazing. They, they, no, they, they don't subscribe to that whole, they don't even know what it is. It's, it's amazing how it's very parent-driven. Yes. We're going off topic here. No, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's very parent-driven to, to say, to raise your boys as, as boys that are yeah. chauvinistic. Yeah. It very much comes from the mom and dad. Yeah. Because they don't know any different. No. And and my husband's not like that. He's yeah. like, if you if you want to be a ballet dancer, you can go be a yes. ballet dancer. He's not like one of these. You will be a rugby player. People. Yeah, yeah. And I really appreciate that about him. Yeah, definitely. And if they they don't think there's anything wrong with pink or anything wrong with being a girl, yes. you throw like a girl. You do X or Y. And they'll probably be like, I hope so, because my mom is so strong. She exactly. throws really hard. <laughs> exactly. Actually, they are very very aware of that, and yeah. it definitely comes from from parenting. Mm. But my dad was a good parent to me. So. Yes, he was. He, he was made you example. super strong, like you are, and efficient and successful. Yeah, he, he really did. He taught me a Set hell a good of a lot. Example. He actually re- only realized how much they gave you when they oh, gone. Yeah. Mm. And well, also makes you actually love yourself more on yes. a self-love thing. Yes. Do you remember I said to you, I, ha- I always hated my freckles. Yes. Hated them. And now you Would have paid them. thousands yeah, yeah. to have these things freaking lasered off I me. I love them. Yeah. <laughs> I love them now. Yes. Now when I look at a photograph of myself, I always think, oh, I must try to filter it to get, like, make the freckles look like less. Yeah, yeah. And now I love, I will put that picture on with all the freckles on because that looks like my dad. Yeah. And I love it. That's Because so I'm nice. like, I'm actually my father's daughter. It's an acceptance, yeah. Mm. Aww, you start that's... loving your heritage and who you are. Your legacy. When a piece of it gets taken away from you. Legacy coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> so quite fitting that uh, uh, yeah, this podcast episode is sponsored by Legacy Books. Yes, um, <laughs> it's funny that I announced it yesterday and now mm. today we're doing this podcast mm. and it, literally this wasn't a planned episode. No, it just kind of happened, which mm. I'm actually glad about because I think a lot of people are going through this right now. And if we can help make things resonate with you and just help you have a good cry in the car. And get a different and perspective. Yeah, then I think our job here is done. Yes, so sure. thank you for Delia coming and having a little chat with us. And I think you handled very well. I'm very proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, up next, you will hear from Kat. So next up, we have Kat, and we are going to be chatting to her about the grief of losing a parent. She's actually lost both of her parents. So this will be like a twofold question to her. So welcome, Kat. Thank you for having me, Jane. As always, it's lovely to chat to you, even when the subject sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's be honest. Let's be honest. But it's an important one to chat about because it's going to happen to all of us eventually. Yes, exactly. And I think um, everyone's story is going to re- resonate with different people. Absolutely. Absolutely. So tell me about your youth, your childhood um, with your parents. <laughs> my youth and my childhood was an interesting briefly because we know that yours is like yeah <laughs> mine, is, mine is terrifying <laughs> um 
Yeah. So I, I like to think that I had a normal childhood, only that I grew up to be an adult and learned that I didn't have a normal childhood whatsoever. <laughs> um, it was just normal for me. I grew up with activist parents. and But one thing I will say, and before I bore you with all, any details, you can Google me if you like, um, is that I had a childhood that was extremely run on love. Mm. Um, I, there was never a moment in my life growing up where I didn't feel loved or didn't feel supported in any way, even when I was a complete, absolute idiot to my parents. <laughs> I can't imagine that, Catherine. <laughs> no, I was a complete rebel. No, 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 Jay, no, you know me. I was, I was an angel. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So it must have been quite interesting finding out that afterwards, like, oh, it's not normal to be followed in a car by other people. And <laughs> no, it's not normal to have your house ransacked or be followed by cops all the time or have your mom, like, not come home or any of that stuff. Yeah, no, it was quite interesting. I mean, I think I only really realized it when I was a teenager. Yeah. Um, and then, like, later on, probably in my 20s, I really realized what they were really doing. And yeah, but to me it was normal. So you don't re- you grow up not thinking about these things being anything other than your reality. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so when you yeah. think back on your parents, you can answer for, separately for each one. What was the most stand out thing about your dad and then about your mom? Okay, both of them were excellent communicators. Um, I'll say that. Uh, my father was far more hands-on emotionally available whereas my mother was far more hands-on emotionally strong um her biggest lesson to us was you know chin up fork for it and do your thing whereas my dad was far more I feel like my dad was far more willing to be no no willing is the wrong word um he was far more touchy-feely emotional whereas my mother had the ability to shut down and get things done so he was more affectionate, like physically affectionate. I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't say he was more physically affectionate. I just think that his perspective on dealing with emotions and things like that, he was much more equipped to do that. And I think a lot of that had to do with my mom's childhood because she was yeah. very much, she grew up knowing that she was not a mistake in inverted mm. commas. Um, and so she didn't, she had the ability to shut down emotion quite easily, which is, something that I envy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't compartmentalize like you can. <laughs> I know someone who can compartmentalize like that. I'm not pointing any fingers <laughs> whatsoever. Facing <laughs> and a curse. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I know. Yes, I know. Um, so tell us how old were you? What was the situation in your life at the time for each of them? Okay, so my dad, my dad had a stroke when I was five months pregnant uh, with my daughter and we thought it was a stroke and he went in and out of hospital for several months and they eventually diagnosed him with terminal cancer and he died three weeks after my daughter was born Mm -hmm. and then with my mom was five years later um, also weirdly enough around my daughter's birthday just before her fifth birthday but my mom had actually beaten cancer twice which within those two that five-year period she'd gone into she'd had breast cancer had surgery and some treatments and gone into remission. And then it had been found somewhere else. Um, and I think she, I think she underwent treatment for that. I can't remember, but yeah. But yeah, so within that, those five years, she had quite a struggle, but she again did it on her own and refused to let a lot of us knew her. Um, she was quite, yeah, I think it was more difficult in retrospect dealing with my mom because we knew what to expect. Yeah. With my dad, it was completely new territory for all of us. Um, so with my mom, it was almost a fait accompli when you are to expect, and she refused to accept it, uh, whatsoever. Whereas my dad was by that, by the stage that he was told he was terminal, he was so very much into the morphine (laughs) that he didn't really care. (laughs) Um, my mom, on the other hand, she was a fighter and she didn't, she refused to accept it right up until the end. It's so interesting how they were so different in that way as well. They used to balance each other out really, really well. Um, he, my mother used to be extremely direct with her emotions, whereas my father was always more exploratory. Um, and yeah, she just refused. 
she she absolutely I think that was probably one of the toughest parts of losing her was was her not accepting that this was the way things were going to go was that do you think that was the last time that she didn't accept it or was every time she didn't accept no, no, it, she it, no, it it's I think every single no, I think every single time she didn't accept it and it worked for her up until a point but eventually yeah it, I mean eventually with my mom what also happened with her she also had a stroke um it's actually quite a cuck story because um she lay on the floor of her apartment and we couldn't get hold of her and we couldn't get into her flat. Um, and she was eventually found um, and taken to hospital. And that was when she was hospitalized for six weeks and never came out. Cheapers. So, well, she did eventually come out and went into care and then hospice and then she died in hospice. By the way, on that note, I need to punt hospice. Yeah. Best care in the world. You, you cannot give enough money to hospice. Mm. You cannot give enough love to hospice. And you absolutely cannot applaud them enough for their service. They're incredible people. They just like, it's, and it's like an unconditional love for people that aren't even connected to them. So following on from your dad passing, how did you deal with having a newborn? It's like your first child. I mean, I know what it's like and how scary and yeah, it's just confusing time. And you're just running on empty and you're running on adrenaline. And basically, how did you cope with losing your dad literally in the throes of this gorgeous little newborn? And, you, you know, it should be a happy time. I didn't. Uh, I think that um, I think that I inherited my mother's ability to emotionally compartmentalize. Don't laugh, Jane, because it's true. <laughs> <laughs> and I just didn't deal with it. I don't think I dealt with as the actual process of losing my dad until my daughter was about to had to just focus on what was in front of me and that was raising a brand new baby um and yeah. get on with it and in retrospect I used to feel quite weird about I think I had a lot of guilt about it because uh, I didn't really accept my dad being dead for at least two years but um I think I had guilt about it but then I also think that I knew that my dad would be quite proud of me because he knew that that's what important. Me mourning him wasn't going to bring it back. Yeah. Me raising his granddaughter would. In, in, in many respects, it would be the more important thing to do. I, you can't bring people back. Yeah, and you can't stop because they are reliant on you. No, absolutely. Um, so well, the one thing I will say, like, when he did die, we had, um, I, was, I went straight to my mother's house the day he died, and our... <laughs> pharmacy my parents local pharmacy because they'd been there for i mean they've been in the middle of the 70s um they immediately got in touch with me and sent over everything for jungle juice they were like we know where you are don't worry you've got it everything um i was like ah, new baby. Ah, ah. everything and then we, we sent over i think it was within half an hour they sent over the parcel for all the ingredients for jungle juice and they were like you just get on with it and yeah, my little fucking like, manual pump. Um, <laughs> hoping that the- yeah, because stress can cause you to um, yeah. your supply to dip. So that was a great way of them helping you along there. Very much so. I did very no shame. They, they were very very sweet and practical. And I think that they more than I think I know they had been very sweet and practical with my parents as well. With my mom taking care of my dad before he went to the hospital for the last time, and they had been very much a support line for her. So yeah, so I, I think you learn really quickly who your true community is as well yeah um uh, i think i think i really probably just kind of stuck my head into raising my daughter and didn't deal with it until she was about two years old yeah well you have to you just have to keep going huh? yeah um so if there's anyone out there that perhaps is going through the same thing right now and it's like the first few weeks of having a baby or months or weeks or years what tools would you tell them to use to cope maybe okay so i'm gonna i'm gonna tell you a story and then i'm gonna tell you about tools um with my dad when he was when when they told they told him he was terminal um well we told him he was terminal um he had this theory because he was a theory dude that he had to make space um in the world so for him very much so and he told this to me one afternoon that I was with him, he, he told us to me that he was nearly making space for her. And that gave me a lot of comfort. Um, I think that you are never going to be prepared for losing a parent, but you will 
get to continue living in a world where there were words still exist. Um, and he had this whole thing about how he needed to make space and how he had done what he needed to do. And he was fine. And I think that that helps because I've kept all the things, whether they were spoken or written or what have you. Uh, those little touchstones for your parents have really, really helped. The thing that confuses me and it's difficult for me is where people don't necessarily have a great relationship with their parents. Because I know that I'm one of the lucky ones. Does that make sense? I'm, I, I know that I'm extremely lucky to have all of these things and to have grown up in a, a, an environment that loved me, no matter what I did <laughs> or didn't do. And um, so a lot of people don't have that. And a lot of people have this weird relationship with their parents that's either completely perfunctory or it's non-existent. Um, and sometimes there's comfort in that too when you lose them because there's no, you may not necessarily have something that has, that they passed on to you or there may not be some kind of legacy or something like that. But what you do have is freedom, freedom from it. So I think that for every single person, they need to find their own tools for getting through it. They are obviously, you know, the, the, the standard tools like go to counseling if you feel that you can't continue. Um, chatting to a friend, finding a support group, that kind of thing. But it's, it's an experience that will affect your life in a way that no one can predict. So, so find the tools that work for you. Just make sure that they're not harmful to anyone else or yourself. Yeah. I think that's great advice and a great story. And I think, I think that each of you in this episode is going to help someone out there, you know, sadly it happens every day in the most traumatic circumstances and it's just nice to know that you're not alone it happens to all of us eventually um and all of our experiences are unique and different um your experience of losing joan is completely different to me losing my grandmother my grandmother didn't like me <laughs> you know so and i and i grew up knowing that kind of thing um so yeah i it's to me, I've never understood the grandmother granddaughter relationship, and I see it with you and, and Joan, and I see it with my kid and her grand on her dad's side, and I see it with my kid and my mom. Uh, there was a whole relationship there that I had never had in my life, and I know will, will never have. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's it's a fascinating kind of bond, um, but it is different for every single person. I look, I look at my daughter and her grandmother and her dad's side and I'm not going to say that I'm jealous because <laughs> I'm not, but what I am is fascinated because there's a bond not, you can't quite quantify and it's incredible. Yeah, it's true. So true, Catherine. <laughs> no, listen, you know I'm the oracle of truth. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for doing this video call we're actually seeing each other life in the times of coronavirus <laughs> same brain same brain all right babe um but thank you for joining us and for giving us your pieces of advice that's a pleasure so up next, we are talking to Lulu Becker, aka Lulu Physio. I'll never stop calling you that. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone does. So she's going to talk a bit about losing her dad when she was living in London. So tell us how many years ago that was now and the whole situation. A lot of us obviously know because we follow you on Instagram <laughs> and you were on um, a previous episode, but we didn't go very much into it. So uh, tell us a little bit about everything that happened. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me again, Gia Jane. Mm -hmm. um, so, as Jane said, we were living in London and um, my dad was diagnosed with melanoma cancer, which was, I think, all the more terrifying because I've had three melanomas too. And um, he, so he was diagnosed just before I felt pregnant with Poppy and was being treated and while he was unwell with the treatment we weren't we certainly weren't expecting him to to pass away and then 1st of July 2015 ended up being the craziest day of my whole life so I gave birth to Pops in the morning 
and we spoke to dad twice on FaceTime that afternoon. He was so excited, his first grandchild, and um, he had, we gave her his middle name, and um, then that evening, my brother phoned, so my mum and my sister were in London with me for the birth, so I felt awful that they were there, and yeah, that same evening as Pops was born, um, my brother phoned to say that my dad had just passed away. Um, we think that he had a blood clot to his lungs as a result of the hardcore treatment that he was having for the melanoma. But it really was the absolute most surreal day of my entire life. And I always think, you know, there's so many days in your life that you never think about again, ever. And then to have one day to have a baby born in the morning and then lose your dad that evening. But it's unbelievable how many ladies how many friends i've come across who've actually had so similar really this birth and death on the same day or on days of meaning is mm. just it's so so yeah much more common i think than you yeah. think scary yeah yeah you've just had a baby and you sh- and your first baby and you should be so happy but now you've got this devastating news so you're like on a high and then you hit a low how did you cope being a new mom for the first time and like hours old only and then have to deal with that as well did you compartmentalize or like how did you do that yeah i think it was just absolute survival mode Mm. um so obviously in the uk if you've had a a normal birth you go home quite quickly afterwards so i think thank goodness she was born at four in the morning and i was home by lunchtime Um, because I think that made it easier, obviously, being at home with my husband and then my mum and my sister there, as I said. And then it was almost like on a purely practical level, we had to get the logistics sorted out yeah. because my mom and my sister obviously needed to then get back to South Africa. We couldn't travel. I mean, I obviously just had a baby that day. Uh, and she needed a passport. And she needed a passport. And um, thankfully, she was able to. She was eligible for a British passport yeah. because the South African okay. ones take so long yeah. when you're in London. Um, so we had to start. Yeah, so we had to get my mom and my sister back to South Africa. Even then, also mm-hmm. on the more like practical <laughs> level, um, my dad's business, like having to sort out that all you know, all the financial side, the things you don't really think yeah. of, like you know, having to speak to the bank and say, well. He's just passed away, but we need to make sure that everything, you know, everyone's still going to be paid and things need to happen. Mm. And then, um, oh, trying to find them the quickest route back to SA. I think they went by, like, I don't know, some strange African, some different African yeah, country yeah, or something. Um, and then we were in, yeah, sorting out the passport. And also then just dealing with having this... Um, Brand new Baba. No, I was going to say, you don't actually know what you're doing with the first one no. anyway. If you, if you hear any knocking around, it's because Pepe's in here with us. <laughs> Cruising around. <laughs> so I was looking at this um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross grief cycle, um, just as I was thinking about what we're going to talk about today. And I was just seeing how her different different phases that she talks about really played in so perfectly with with me so the first she talks about is denial and I think it was exactly that like I remember my mum speaking to my brother and then just saying no like it can't be and then she said dad's just I don't know sitting there and I was like this this can't actually be true we've just been you know we all been cooing over this brand new baby we're sitting at home and you'd been talking you'd video and we'd called. spoken to him twice that afternoon and I just remember and she lists under this denial it's avoidance confusion shock fear and i would say definitely all of those and i just remember almost feeling numb Mm. just being like i don't actually know how to even think about any of this and then the next one she talks about is anger Mm. and that for me was a huge one in those next two weeks and under anger she lists frustration irritation anxiety And I think I was just so angry. I was angry that he had had to suffer before he passed away, Mm. that he had gone through all this treatment that had taken him from being like this, you know, super burly farmer, life and soul of the party, to someone who was really quite frail. Um, I was angry that 
I had to go through so much on the same day. I was mm. angry that I, I felt guilty that my mom and sister had been with me, yeah. which he had insisted that they come. I know he would be like, that's ridiculous if you're feeling guilty about that. Um, so definitely the anger. And then the night before we were, so we managed to get her passport. And the night before we were flying back to SAA, I was diagnosed with a, a breast abscess. I'm so it was mastitis that had turned into an abscess. And um, so the night before we were flying, I was in Annie and they were like trying to drain pus out of this thing. Oh, my word. And then flying back to SAA, just with this like absolutely on fire abscess. I remember we landed here at Kick Shaka and my father in law came to fetch us and drove us straight to Gateway Hospital where there was a surgeon waiting. And um, he had to lance the thing. And then I've since read that the, um, the emotional link with breast abscess is anger. And I mean, in hindsight, of course, it yeah. is 100%. And if we look at where I was in the Kubler-Ross cycle too, so... I was so in that anger too. I just remember um, the next day at the funeral, everyone coming to hug me and, oh, just, no. and I was just like, oh, just on She's fire so with this whole, um, with this abscess and just, yeah, just absolutely in, in survival mode. And I think that's kind of where I stayed until she was about four months I was just absolutely in survival mode looking after this little baba in quite disbelief that it actually happened and then I hit what she says is the third stage in the cycle which is depression oh. and that is honestly when I felt like my wheels came off mm. so four months she stopped sleeping um it beat, and my husband's um contract wasn't renewed at work um and suddenly just everything was just so hectic and so on top of us and that was definitely when I just felt like okay hold on this mm. has been survival mode but now things just really aren't working yeah and um that was when I started seeing a bereavement counselor which is my biggest recommendation for anyone who has lost someone mm. she honestly changed my whole life um and then I think it was from working with the um the bereavement counsellor that I really started to, to be able to work through some things. Just looking here underneath what Kubler-Ross has for depression, overwhelmed. Yes, yeah. I felt so overwhelmed. I was also just holding so much weight from the pregnancy. So I felt awful in my physical self. I felt low emotionally. Mm -hmm. We were worried just about everything. Um, helplessness, definitely. Um, flight. And I remember having a moment where I just thought, I feel like I just need to like take the baby and run and it's amazing like how your subconscious like I just wanted to go back to our family farm yes. and almost just be like held in that safe space mm. of all my family that was still there and also to be there for my family that were going through so much but now yeah. we were on the other side of the world but I thought it was interesting looking at what she had under this depression which was this flight and it really is you just like I just almost just want to take myself away. away from my reality to your safe space yeah and run back to where you know, it was our family farm that I'd lived on pretty much my whole life. Mm. Um, and I'll never forget coming back when we came back for the funeral. So she was, what? So 1st of July, and we had the funeral on the 18th. So she was seven to one of them, 16 days old. I suppose I don't count the first day of their birth. And um, parking at home and my brother, the one who's just below me, came out and he was wearing one of my dad's jackets and they look so similar oh. and it was the weirdest thing my heart just went like <gasps> because I mean how many years at boarding school away at varsity mm -hmm. away in London come home and my dad would always just walk out of the house with like the biggest biggest smile and then to see my brother who looked so similar to him was just like the most surreal yeah surreal thing and then I entered into the bargaining Hmm. which she talks about struggling to find meaning, reaching out to others, telling one's story. And I suppose perhaps that's where it came in with seeing the bereavement counsellor too, who helped me work through so, so much. Um, and also just having other people reach out to me who had been through similar things. Um, and just trying to work through it, work through it all in my heart. And then the final stage, she talks about acceptance, exploring options, new plan and place moving on yeah. and um i saw the most beautiful way of grief being described um which is if you imagine you've got a square box and inside that box on the one side there's a big rectangular panic button or like a grief button okay mm -hmm. 
So in the early stages of grief, there's a massive ball bouncing around this box. So the chances of the big ball hitting the panic grief button are, are good. Mm. And you get less breaks but between that button being pushed each time. As you move through it, the ball gets smaller, which means that it's less likely to whack the button mm. as many times. And it means you get a bit more of a break in between. And I thought that just sums it up so beautifully. It's still there, but it's just... It's still there, but it means you get more time to breathe in between, mm. and it's not whacked as frequently. And I think I realized that I was really moving into that acceptance when I was when I was thinking about him. It wasn't him like being sick and us struggling with managing all the treatments and everything. It was like thinking of him being so silly and ridiculous and like remembering the happiness more than that last year yes. where he was so unwell. Yeah. Which, is, which is beautiful. Yeah, and I mean the point. ball. Yeah, but the ball still whacks the bats. And even last yeah. night, I was like looking back at the. Um, my sister was amazing. She was sixteen when he died, what? and yeah, and she actually spoke at his at his service. And um, I was looking back at what I got her to read for me about dad, and I was like, oh goodness, there goes the ball, the ball on the yeah. button. And you're like yeah. a sixteen year old can say that. Yeah, wow. she was incredible. Though. Yeah, she spoke and read for us too. Yeah. Okay, so for anyone who's going through this right now and it's quite fresh for them, or even if it's a few years and they're still not coping, what would your advice be for them? So I think the thing that I I say most frequently to people is the only thing that actually heals is time and it's the one thing you can't speed up. But just know that how you're feeling now, you're not going to feel like this forever. Yeah. does actually get, like, as much as it, it's such a cliche, it's the truth. Yeah, it's the, it's the only thing, you know, like we were just saying with that ball in the box, the only thing that lets that ball get smaller and stop whacking that button as frequently is is time. Then I will I also just re- recommend to everyone to see a, a bereavement counsellor. Yeah. Even if it's once, just oh, go. Definitely. At my final session with my lady, I said, but everyone should come and speak to you once a month like everyone would just feel so much better so definitely bereavement counseling and then something that our family does which um we have found really helpful is um we try and all meet together for a meal on his birthday so now it's not the February they're actually here in Coxat uh here from Coxat in Durban and then um we celebrate dad's last day on earth Mm. and then we celebrate poppy's birthday obviously on the first so the day before yes um Uh, we will also then often have a a family gathering and we go around and everyone shares their favorite story or their favorite memory and our family who's not there we've got a big family whatsapp group we'll send a message and then someone else will read them out so we have found that such a nice way of just honoring his life celebration such a celebration and yeah just keeping his memory alive yeah that's what we did on monday it was my grand's birthday so we went to chateau gat and we had oh, cake and fun. yeah we always do something on her birthday as yeah, well which is nice. make it a celebratory yeah it, i think changing the connotation of the day really does help definitely even with Pepe, with her birthday is the day my grand died and just change having that like, but i planned that obviously but um having that to change that day oh. but then you can you know it's like a two-sided day as well I think is it, it's quite special for her. Also, her second name is Joan, so it also brings it in. Yeah. And you know what Janelle said about souls and all that jazz. Yeah. So it's like, a for me, it was such a nice way of bringing her back. Definitely, definitely. But that's enough we were stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah. But thank you to Lily for coming and sharing your story. And for anyone who's going through this right now, just know that we are thinking of you. And if you need to reach out to any of us, just send us a DM on Instagram. And Definitely. It's, as I said, it's Lulu Fizio. And like, it's hard not to find her. But you can hear Pepe is reading a happiness journal in the background. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks to everyone for listening from Lulu, myself, and from Pepe. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Unselfishly Me. Follow us on Instagram at unselfishlyme and check out our website www.unselfishlyme.com.